as we turn to the book of Nehemiah, we're going to focus on the work today. And how, in the case of Nehemiah, going back to Judah, back to the city of Jerusalem, his praise and worship of of God is ultimately what leads him and the people to rebuild the walls of the city. More simply put, his faith led him to do something about it. I hope this message challenges you, because it was challenging me to write it. (laughs) And so turn with me to the book of Nehemiah, and to uh, your your inserts here to, to follow along. I've talked about some of maybe the more, I don't want to call them famous, the, the more well-known characters and Bible stories um, through most of the sermon. Nehemiah is often one that goes under the radar, and that's actually why we're coming to it. Um, it was, to be frank with you, a story that I knew less than the other ones. Um, but in reading it and in preparation for this, it might be one of the more impactful ones that, that genuinely shows us what the Great Commission is, is all about, in a way. Right, and we see this as we open right into the book, of, the book of Nehemiah. We get a glimpse into the heart of Nehemiah. He is heartbroken right, over the city of Jerusalem. And the first couple of verses here, uh, we're told that things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. So the Israelite people were in exile in Babylon. Um, we see a handful of the prophetic books, books like Daniel, are written about that time. When Persia overtook Babylon, the governor, the Emperor Cyrus, um, allowed the people to go back to Jerusalem. They were allowed to return home. And that's where we pick up. Um, is that the people who have returned are not doing so well. Uh, some Judeans and Israelites, like Nehemiah, stayed in, in Persia. And so that's where Nehemiah currently is. He is in uh, the land of Persia, reflecting on what is happening back in Judah in Jerusalem, that these people are not doing well, they're in great trouble and disgrace. Why? Uh, Because the walls of Jerusalem have been torn down, uh, and the gates have been destroyed by fire. And when he hears this, he sits down and weeps. Um, King Nebuchadnezzar had the king of Babylon uh, destroyed the the temple in Jerusalem. Um, And part of destroying the temple is destroying the city walls that fortify the city. And so right away we get into this This isn't just a work that needs to be done. This is genuinely something that that is at the very heart of Nehemiah. And as he sits down and weeps over this, what he does is he chooses to pray. This whole story, we're going to talk a lot about the work that was done and what the people did with their hands and feet. But it only goes as far as their heart is going to go. There's something about Nehemiah that almost a lot of times before he speaks, we're told that with a prayer to God, with a prayer to the Lord of Heaven, Nehemiah prayed. Like this response of praying first is one that we really need to start to copy. Now I have a couple of verses there Three, but I'm going to read you the, the full prayer that Nehemiah has. And when he knows this, I'm going to start in verse 4. He sits down and, and weeps. In fact, for in those days, he mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. And here's what he prays, starting in verse 5. O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commands, listen to my prayer. Look down and see me praying night and day for your people Israel, I confess that we have sinned against you, lest even my own family and I have sinned. We have sinned terribly by not obeying the commands, decrees, and regulations that you gave us through your servant Moses. Please remember what you told your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful to me, I will scatter you among the nations. 
But if you return to me and obey the commands and live by them, then even if you are exiled to the ends of the earth, I will bring you back to the place I have chosen for my name to be honored. The people you rescued by your great power and strong hands are your servants. O Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to the prayers of those who delight in honoring you. Please grant me success today by making the king favorable to me and put it into his heart to be kind to me. That, that prayer could essentially be a sermon in itself. Uh, but if we're going to do this whole worship thing, that's where it starts. Right? Nehemiah is going to ask the king to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the wall. It's a mighty task. But somehow his prayer starts with, you're the God who keeps his covenant to those who love you. But he confesses his sin and then asks for this blessing on the work that he is going to do in the name of the Lord. Ultimately, this can serve as another prayer model. It's kind of one of those, like many of the Psalms, like the Lord's Prayer that we pray. Like, if you don't know what to pray, just pray that. That's part of the reason why the opening prayer has turned a lot to just reading Psalms, like just praying Scripture. Because if we don't know what to pray, just pray Scripture. And a lot of times, what they're saying is really in line with what we need to say. And so this is what Nehemiah does. And so when he goes to the king, this is in the beginning of, of chapter 2, that Nehemiah is serving as the, the king's cupbearer at this time. Uh, so he's very close to the king. He works very closely um, in, in accordance with the king and, and when Nehemiah shows up, the king asks him, you see, the, of why are you looking so sad? You're not sick. There's something that is deeply troubling to you. Once again, this problem was not only something that Nehemiah felt he needed to go do, it was something that genuinely was at the heart of his worship and broke the heart of, of Nehemiah. And then you get those magical words of, with a prayer to the God of heaven, he replies, but If it pleases the king, and if you are pleased with me, your servant send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. Allow me to travel back to Judah to rebuild the wall. And yet in every instance with this, of a deeply troubled man, somehow feels the need to pray before he responds. Lesson number one that I think a lot of us could really take. Because in this emotional state, it, Nehemiah could respond in something that is very upsetting to the king, um, or in a great way of the king not allowing him to go back, then what? Uh, but he leads in this with prayer, but it doesn't necessarily stop there. This whole book is about how Nehemiah actually goes back to Judah. He doesn't just say, like, look how much these people are struggling without the walls to Jerusalem. There's a big problem that these people could really need solved. I'll just pray for them. He says a prayer. He prays first. He starts with his worship of the Lord. But then he actually puts boots on the ground and he goes back to Judah. Like, he goes to the king and says, let me go to Judah. The king's going to say yes. And then he goes to Judah and rebuilds the wall. That could, that, I'm going to elaborate a lot more on those simple things, but that is the core of this message of where is our heart leading in the worship of God, pray about it, and then we need to put boots on the ground to go actually do the work as the church. That this worship should ultimately lead us into something. And the whole point of this sermon series is only that God has given his people the opportunity to go do those things, to be the workers for his glory. But he somehow provided everything that they need along the way. Whether it has been courage or the supplies or places to stay or certain people to uphold them as we look through the countless amounts of characters and we're going to keep going with this sermon series, 
There is blessing, and there is resources. God has provided precisely and just exactly what His people need to do the work that He is calling them to do. Uh, Nehemiah says to the king, If it pleases the king, let me have letters addressed to the governors of the province west of the Euphrates River, instructing them to let me travel safely through their territories on my way to Judah. Please give me a letter addressed to Asaph, the manager of the king's forest, uh, including instructing him to give me timber. I will need it to make beams for the gates of the temple, for just for the sea walls, and for a house for myself. And the king granted me these requests, not because Nehemiah was really good and he was a very good salesman, but because the gracious hand of God was on him. At this time, resources were not always plentiful. Um, and so, as country leaders, where the, the threat of war is, is ever looming, at this time we're not super far removed from Persia overtaking Babylon, that to then cross country borders and travel back across country lines, there was going to be uh, incredible interrogation and a lot of just turn around and go back where you came from. Okay, so that's why Nehemiah prays for, and, and asks for the letters to freely travel and also asks for the resources of well, he's going to get back to Judah, to Jerusalem. The city's been destroyed. The temple's been destroyed. There's not a ton of supplies there. And so he could go, but as much heart as Nehemiah has, he can't just make enough supplies magically appear on his own power to rebuild entire walls for the city of Jerusalem. It's too mighty act. Because here's the other thing. If you let Nehemiah go back, who's to say he ever returns? It could be this way of, of him traveling and getting out of the king's court to go back to be with his people. Nehemiah continues to be faithful. At the end, he returns back to, to work with the king. The point being here is, this is a tall ask for a tall job. Like, Rebuilding walls around Jerusalem is not a, a simple task that's going to take you an hour or two. And yet, he's blessed. The king allows him to go, and the king grants these requests that he has for, for what he needs to do the job. And it's all because the Lord was present with him guiding these conversations. And I think that is ushered in, in a sense, because of what Nehemiah is praying. This prayer first, before we ask and before we go, what ushers in a lot of times for us to see the gracious hand of God around us, with us, and, and continuing to provide for us. Now, this is the good part, but there's always somebody who's going to be upset. There's going to be opposition. Because anytime somebody likes something, somebody doesn't like something. Well, we're introduced to, to two people uh, made by the names of Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite. Um, they are province officials. Um, they have other lands they report to the king. Uh, we get those specific titles for, for you to know that they're not Israelite people. But the Israelites were in Babylon. Persia took over Babylon. Uh, so if we give the Israelites too much power or their own place, they're just going to govern themselves. Uh, they're going to rebel against the king. That's how governments work. It might not be too far off. But so these people don't want the, the Israelites to have any sort of stability or comfort. Um, that they might rebel against their provinces under their kingship. That's why they're very displeased that somebody had come to help Israel. That's in the second chapter, but it's the first time we're introduced to them. And, and it ultimately comes as Nehemiah has this king, if you, if you read chapter 2 through, uh, Nehemiah has the courage, asks the king, the king blesses it, and then we're told these people don't like it. 
and welcome to the human race. That's how it goes. But later in, in the chapter, we get to them again as they're starting this process of beginning to build the wall, in a sense. Sambar and, and Tobiah, they ask this question. Basically, who do these people think they are? They don't have anything. Do they actually think that they can do it? Do these people really believe they can make something from stones, from a rubbish heap and charred ones at that? How are these people going to build walls for this magnificent city out of stones and ashes? I present to you Ash Wednesday. And it's been out of the stones, the rubbish heaps, the, the charred ashes, the things that have been laid down and destroyed in this world that the Lord brings life to. Right, read Genesis 2, and it's out of the dirt, out of the dust of the ground that you and I came. God takes these charred ashes, what is this earth, and it's what we proclaim to be made in the image of God. Do they actually think they can do it? I don't know if they actually think they can do it, but I knew Nehemiah believed God could do it. That's the foolish faith piece to this. Right? Because it, it goes on of these people are even more unhappy. They make plans to then come in and fight against Jerusalem and throw everyone into confusion. Right? If I can't stop their heart, I'll stop their hands and destroy their entire workflow and process. And when that doesn't work, then we're just going to start throwing around rumors and accusations. Hey, you, Nehemiah, the Jews are planning to rebel, that's why you're building the wall, and you're the one leading this because you just want to be king. If you've read anything or you are familiar with Nehemiah or anything I've told you about Nehemiah, something's not adding up here. But there is opposition to the work, and it happens in a way that has not left us even into the 21st century, of people who will do whatever it takes, say whatever it takes, to destroy the work that is happening in the name of Christ. There is opposition. And the beautiful piece is it doesn't stop anything. Because here's what the, the charge to Nehemiah is. It's not go build faster. It's not go get more resources. As they're building the wall, that it takes hands, it takes a lot of work, we're talking about the entire city of Jerusalem, but the people aren't going to be super uh, close to each other. You and I could be working together, but we're going to be on opposite sides of the city. We have churches, that we all have a church, and we have churches, and people meeting right now are on opposite sides of the town, opposite sides of the city, the state, the country, the world. But when you hear the blast of the trumpet, put down the work and go worship. That whenever it is sounding, run the way that is, then our God will fight for us. To take you back to the walls of Jericho. Right when the trumpets sound on the seventh day, scream and shout and lift up a song of praise and the walls are going to come tum tumbling down to then rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. You can work and work and work. When you hear the blast of the trumpet rush to whenever it is sounding, our God will fight for us. Right, maybe that trumpet is your Sunday morning alarm clock. Of we work and work and work and work for six days to genuinely do the work of the Lord. But when Sunday morning hits, that we know we need to be here to put down the work and to genuinely come into the heart of worship. Right, and it's here that I hope you find that the Lord is for you and fighting for you. Because on October 2nd, it's a different... I'm not, I gave you October 2nd because that's our calendar, not the, the Hebrew calendar. But on October 2nd, the wall was complete. Just 52 days. 
after we had begun. When our enemies and the surrounding nations heard about it, they were frightened and humiliated. They realized this work had been done with the help of our God. But there's so much in this. What, the first part of like the miracle of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem for 52 days. As you drive through York, you're going to drive through 52 days of construction for the next, and they're never going to get anything done. I've been living here long enough to know how long it took to finish Mount Rose. And they rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem in 52 days. And the people around it go, uh-oh, there's something going on here. Because that group of Israelites, that group of exiled people, they can't do anything. And yet somehow it's that very group of people that came and rebuilt the walls for the holy city in under two months. How? They realized they didn't, it wasn't really about the Israelite people doing the work. They rebuilt the wall because of the help of God that was with them. Like, think about this. If Nehemiah doesn't get the blessing from the king, if the gracious hand is not with Nehemiah in the beginning, I don't know if Nehemiah makes it back to Judah. If the king doesn't bless Nehemiah with free travel, how quick, long does it ever take him to get there? If he doesn't have the resources, do they have the resources to rebuild the wall? Let alone if they never go back, if Persia never overtakes Babylon. I mean, we're talking a lot of things that have to go right for this to happen. And the only reasonable explanation of it is that the hand of God was with them every step of the way. And so the charge from Nehemiah is to pray to the Lord your God and to obey the law that he gave through Moses. Before this, the book before Nehemiah, as it's in our Bible, is, is the book of Ezra. Ezra returns uh, to Jerusalem a few years before Nehemiah. Ezra is a teacher of the law and a very, very good one at that. So when this is complete, Nehemiah could throw the, the parade for himself of Look at the work that I led. But instead, he goes to Ezra. Tells Ezra to bring out the book of the law of Moses, right, the, the Torah, and read it to the people. And they read from the book of the law, clearly explaining the meaning of what was being read, helping the people understand each passage. The charge of, if you think this is magnificent, the work we just did, read the law, and you'll find something more magnificent. This is, like, the work that they did is an invitation into deeper walk with the Lord. And the very important piece to this, it, it is the final part there is, they took the book of the law, they taught it and explained everything very clearly so that they understood the message. Each passage. I am aware sometimes I can talk a lot. But the reason that I do that, in a sense, is it is my obligation, I feel, to give you a complete message. That when, especially in the sermon series, when you leave here, you understand the passages that we are talking about. That you don't leave, think of and went, I don't know the beginning, middle, and end of that story. I try to give you the of a sermon as I can deliver to you each week. It takes a little bit. But I would talk for a little bit longer and you understand the passage, then you leave here missing in the same way that and Ezra taught the people is the message of this 
He's known for leading the rebuilding of the world. Nehemiah is really about charging the people to love prayer, to love the Word of God, and to do it. We call that the charge of the church. It's in the book of Nehemiah. And I want to back through sort of brief. This is all sort of from Nehemiah's perspective. Well, a lot of us, we would be the people. They turn home, they, this is fantastic. They've been in exile for many years. And they finally get to go back home. And yet they don't really have anything. And so to, to put this sort of into the perspective, um, quick history lesson real quick. In 586 uh, B.C., the Babylonians destroyed the town 538 B.C. is when uh, Babylon allowing the the wall is rebuilt in about five years. Here is taking place around and Nehemiah roughly around four. 445. And so we are talking about Babylon when they were led into exile. The temple and the walls of the city specifically in 50 years for this to happen. Generations on generations not knowing when they're ever going to go home. They're granted to go back, but they're not doing well because they have no Fortification, no protection. You're going to return home after this. You're going to leave here. Home. And what protection is there to your base? Because you don't have anything. What we're going to find out is we're going to be like, like these people. Things are not going well. Great trouble and great disgrace. What we'll see is the destruction that's going on. All right. People were they're stirred together. Like, the people actually came together. And we were told that on October 2nd, they finished just 52 days. It takes an extraordinary effort. I don't want to overlook that piece of how the people genuinely came together and in under two months, rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. The only way to do it is if they are genuinely united in the work. And so, to take these the, up to this point, that they've returned home, they're stirred together. The Lord has rescued them. The Lord has sent them somebody to rebuild what they want to call home, given them a vision and a hope to do the work for God, and they come together and do it. And lo and behold, revival happens. There's not a secret formula to this. Ezra faces the square just inside the water gate from early morning until noon and read aloud to everyone who could understand and all the people listened closely to the book of law. If you want revival to come, We need to take the book of the law, the Holy Scripture, seriously. To listen closely and obey. To pray, to meet in the town squares and do the same thing. There's no secret to this. If you want revival in your life, it comes through prayer and the Word. If we want revival in this church, it's going to come through prayer and the Word in a corporate setting. For the world to be changed by Christ, it takes prayer and the Word. And a few people to step out and commit to the work. Here's what the people did. 
They separated themselves from all foreigners as they confessed their own sins and the sins of their ancestors. They remained standing in the place for three hours. Uh, the book of the law from the, from the Lord their God was read aloud to them. Then for three more hours they confessed their sins and worshipped the Lord their God. Who wants to have a six-hour church service? Right? Because that's what the people did. Like, if you want revival, it takes time and effort committed to the Lord. What happens, and what has, I think, plagued the American church, and it certainly, I think, does now, is we've become so comfortable and complacent for church to fit us. If I stood up here and preached for three hours, and then we prayed for three hours, you'd all be gone probably at the hour and a half mark. Or we just wouldn't come at all. And yet they were going to sit and wonder why things haven't changed. Why everything remains the same. Revival takes effort, and it takes surrender and commitment. It takes this repentance, even if it takes three hours, to get a complete message for them to know the Word of God, to know the salvation that's been given to them, for three hours, they, they preached it. I was looking back through some, some old photos, and a year ago, uh, I was at FCA Kutztown Camp, and I came across a picture. Um, that was actually my last job requirement to fulfill with, with FCA. Before I knew I was coming here, I just knew I was leaving. And I knew part of that was stepping into a full-time church, and the prayer I prayed for, for many, many months was, was Lord, if I'm going to go lead a church, please show me like the purest image of what the church is. We have chapel at night. If you think this is long, you should go to an FCA chapel. Uh, we finished at 10 p.m. or so. I wish I'd, I had the picture. It's a group of like 75 teenagers. Like they're just in a circle praying for each other. Literally, like contending with each other. It went on for about two hours until they turned the lights off and told us to leave. And I say that because, listen, church was over. Chapel was over. These kids had two or eight practices. They're going from 6 to 11, 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. with chapels and Bible studies and sports practices. And yet somehow in that moment, 75 teenagers grasped this idea of we cannot leave until these people know the truth and salvation in Christ. Even if they kick me out of the building, I don't care how long it takes. Yes, there's so many other things to do. I can go to bed right now. I'm tired, the work's done, I've already done enough. But in this moment, there are people who need to hear the truth of the gospel, and I'm not leaving until they know it. And lo and behold, that's where revival comes from. But if you think about the revival at Asbury a year or so ago, whenever that was, there's literally a group of people who just refused to leave worship, regardless of how long it took. How long are you willing to sit in the presence of God? When's the last time we just sat and prayed and read? If you want to be challenged by this, go to a room, open up the Bible, a room without a clock, leave your phone and take your watch off. And just sit until you're ready to leave. I think you might be surprised how long you feel and understand you really need to sit there. But the revival came because the people knew they had sinned against the Lord, but yet the Lord had continued to rescue them and to use them. And the final result of this is that they joined behind the leaders, bind themselves with an oath, and choose to obey the law given to them. 
the rest of Nehemiah 10 there lays out some of the, the parts of the law. But they committed themselves to tithing to the temple, to serving the Lord, to being in fellowship with one another, to prayer, to obeying the word of the Lord. Will we, like through revival, through prayer, and through the reading of the scripture, invest in the church? To bind yourself with an oath to the Lord to know that if he has rescued you, we are called as the church to be the hands and feet. And that means investing in the church with time, with resources, with your life. To follow the regulations and the decrees and follow the scriptures. The Bible is your guide to worship. It's so you didn't have to try and figure it out on your own. God says, here I am, and if you want to be my follower, here's how you do it. It's all pretty simple in a way that we can understand. All right, then here's the reality of, uh, of this situation. Nehemiah leaves. And the people fall into apostasy. Apostasy is to sort of abandon a religious or political belief, is, is kind of the root of definition for that. Nehemiah left. There was nobody there continuing to drag them into the city for Ezra to read the law. It really became up to them to keep it going. And what happens? Nehemiah comes back. And ask some pretty fairly simple questions of why have you neglected the temple? Why are you profaning the Sabbath? And how could you even think about committing that sin? The people who did such great work were so united, experienced revival, continued just to fall away. Right, when their leader left, so did a lot of their obedience. And I would ask you, of what that looks like when I'm not standing here with a microphone on Sunday morning. But when we leave each other, what does your faith look like? What does your investment in the church look like? What do your disciplines look like when you don't have someone guiding you through it? It is up to you to build those foundations. I don't want you to go back home with no foundation, with no walls of protection. The armor of God in Ephesians 6 is so that when the devil comes knocking and attacking, you are prepared. That you are armored and ready for the battle. That after the battle, you may still stand strong in the Lord. And how do we break this piece? How do we get over this hump of apostasy in a way? The relate section, I'm going to ask you three questions. You can answer them rhetorically, but I hope that you answer them before the Lord in the week ahead. It's going to be very simple to, to what Nehemiah experienced and led his people through. The first of, of what breaks your heart. Like this is, is ultimately where service and investment in the church start. Of what genuinely breaks your heart for the world. Nehemiah's heart broke because the people returned home and the walls were destroyed. So he went back and rebuilt the walls. The reason I stand here before you is in sports ministry, I started to realize that I cared a lot more about the church and the local church. And things that happened in the local church and how some local churches function needed redeemed. To put it very frankly to the question, my heart broke for the local church. I genuinely think that's part of the reason I'm standing right here in front of you. Right, what 
breaks your heart for this world, for this church, for your own life. It helps us identify kind of that piece to it. Now here's the all important question, what are you going to do about it? If we identify these things of like, our community is broken for Christ, I'm going to go home. Man, I wish church looked a little different. I'll go for an hour and go home and maybe it'll be fixed in a couple Sundays. If where your heart breaks for the Lord, your faith should stir you to do something about it. Right? This is not a salvation by works message. I right? go to Ephesians. Salvation is by grace through faith alone. But if you continue to read Scripture, the people who believed were the people who acted. The people believed the disciples because when they saw the resurrected Christ, they went and died. They went and did the work of the church. When the king saw that Nehemiah was sad and in deeply troubled and said, what can I do to help you? He said, let me go and do it. I understood that I didn't know who was going to be crazy enough to hire a 24-year-old to lead the church. Apparently all of you were. But there's a piece of if something is breaking your heart and you want to see something changed truly for Christ, put your feet on the ground and do it. It's the only way. It's, It's really the biblical way. This piece, Matthew 28, the final words in the Gospel of Matthew of Jesus to his disciples, the Great Commission. I had somebody once tell me it was the Great Commission, not the Great Suggestion, so you should probably do it. And I went, you know what, you're, I think you're right. But Jesus tells them, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them, the baptizing man in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching these new disciples to obey all the commands that I've given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of of the age. This was Jesus' words to the disciples that you have seen the truth. You have seen the resurrected Christ. Go and do something about it. Change the world for Christ. The well in Nehemiah was the glory that God did it. He was with them to the end of the age. He was with them through exile. He was with them and bringing them back to Jerusalem. And he was with them to rebuild his holy city. And when Nehemiah returns, he's going to ask this piece. But is your worship working? And I mean this in a handful of different ways. First. Is your current worship, I won't call it a schedule, disciplines, actually bringing you closer to Christ? And I don't know if anyone's ever asked you that question before, or had you think about that, but it's something I've had to reflect on a handful of times. Of is the way that I'm actually praying, is it really leading me to the throne of God? Or am I just kind of throwing words in the sky hoping they get there? Is the way that I'm reading Scripture actually teaching me anything about the authority of God? Or am I just becoming a little smarter? Is how I come to church actually pursuing me into worship? Or just leading me a couple minutes closer to lunch? Is the way that we are worshiping God, is it actually bringing you closer to God? It's an honest reflection. It's a tough one. But these people who committed themselves to the Lord with Nehemiah said they were going to keep all of these regulations. Apparently it didn't exactly work. And that was the, the charge that Nehemiah gave him at the end of all of these decrees and things you said you were going to do, you've now neglected the church, neglected the Sabbath, and 
You're not making very good decisions. Right? Is your worship working in that sense? And I'm going to bring you to the second part of this of, is your worship of God stirring you to do something? Because if it's not, you should take an honest inventory of that too. This is in Acts chapter 2 of what the early church was like. And the believers devoted themselves to the apostles, teaching, to fellowship, to sharing, and meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. Now, and behold, doing those things, a deep sense of awe came over them, and they performed many miraculous signs and wonders. They, they met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. I'm going to stop there. They devote themselves to Scripture, to church, to sharing in meals, to fellowship, to prayer. And what happened? They walk in a deep reverence for the Lord, and they do the miraculous. They continue to meet together. Because of their praise and worship, they sell things and they invest in the church. They worship each day at the temple. They meet in homes for the Lord's Supper, share meals with a great joy. It's really no surprise that the disciplines they engaged in to worship God are the disciplines they engaged in with other people to tell them about Jesus. There is a direct flow of how you work and the worship that you are doing in private, how that plays out in public. They did all of these things all while enjoying the goodwill of other people. And lo and behold, when they dedicated themselves to the Lord, the Lord added to their number each day. Is your worship working? Is your faith leading you into action? Simple as I can ask it to be. That was the early church. What kind of church do we want to be here? The priests, the Levites, first purified themselves, and then they purified the other people and the work. If you want revival to come through this church, if you want purification to come through this church, it's going to start with you. The revival and purification of your own individual walk with the Lord. The people of Judah took joy in the priests and the Levites and they worked. They took incredible joy in the church. It's going to be really hard to find revival in this church if you don't enjoy being here. And you're not invested truly in the growth of the kingdom of God through the church. We can be a, a church that, that delights this, that genuinely believes that something can come of us just being here. We take you back to this question. Do they actually think they can make something of stones from a rubbish heap and charred ones at that? Did a little uh, church history digging this week. Right of the first church that then when it was coming down left a pile of stones. It is now memorialized in the name of Bethlehem Stone Pile Church. See, it's simple. There was a pile of stones, so you had stone piled in the name. So when you read this, do these foolish people of faith actually think that anything can come from a pile of stones? Lo and behold, you are sitting in this church right now because somebody believed it. And a group of people decided to lead a church on it. What kind of church do we want to be? Do we want to honor that part of the name of we are this church that believes something can come from nothing if we just devote ourselves to it? Or are we going to be a church that falls into apostasy? That might be fantastic on Sundays, but Monday through Saturday, what's the church? I'll leave you with this, this question, what kind of believer do you want to be?
What kind of disciple do you really want to be? That will ultimately lead into what kind of church we become. And what kind of church and what kind of bride the universal church becomes when Christ returns. Join me in prayer. Lord, I thank you, God, this morning that your word speaks to us, it challenges us, that you have entrusted us, the lowly, sinful people of this earth, to carry forth your gospel message. God, we are your people in exile, living in a world that is not our true home, and yet we trust for when you return or when you call us home. As Nehemiah and Israel as we built the wall of Jerusalem, God, we look forward to the rebuilding of the new Jerusalem. Where we will be with you, you will be with us. We will be your people. You will be our God. But until then, we look to the harvests. We look to the field. We look to our houses, our community. We look to our church, knowing that there is work to be done. But the workers are few. God, I pray a prayer of revival, that your spirit comes anew on each and every one of us, that our eyes are reopened to your salvation, our very nature that is contrary is reborn to you to become a new creation in Christ Jesus. God, that the spirit moves to our hands and to our feet, that we begin to take what is our worship and we begin to move. We invest in the local church. We invest in the gospel for our community, for our families, and it starts by investing it into ourselves. And we know that we are running the race and we fight the good fight of faith. My prayer this morning is that we reflect on that. Are we genuinely pursuing you? Are we actually following the commands that you have given us? Do we really want to know who you are? And may we order our lives accordingly. God, this morning we submit to you and to all of your authority. In the powerful name of Jesus we pray. Amen.